And uh, actually, I hope the title will become a bit more uh, self-evident in the rest of the talk. This is a joint work with two colleagues. One is Stefano Bortoli and the other Barbara Mazzanella. They are both from the University of Trento. And two of us also we work for a startup company called Ockham. Uh, a little bit of background. Uh, I'm one of the newcomers to this conference, so it's the first time I uh, attend this conference. Um, and I just wanted to say why uh, I ended up working on identifiers. And the reason is that between 2008 and 2010, I was the coordinator of a large scale integrated project called OCAM, funded by, co funded by the European Commission. Uh, and I will say something about that, but this was mainly in the area of semantic web, and then it was started to, to be called uh, web of data, and then linked data, but that was the domain. Um, and in, the, in that particular project, our aim was to create reusable, shareable identifiers for any kind of entities, in particular for non-digital objects like people, companies, uh, or whatever products. The other connection that I have with the topic of identifiers uh, is a study that they made for the European Commission together with other colleagues, including Martin, who is here today. Uh, and the study was on uh, persistent identifiers for uh, digital objects and authors, in particular. And uh, the goal of the study was to issue recommendations for the Commission. And you can find the final document uh, on the website there. Uh, then, all this uh, expertise, in a sense, is put at use uh, now in, a, in another initiative called the PASEN. This is a network of excellence, again, funded by the European Commission. And our role there is, in particular, to work on, the, on identifiers uh, in the context of digital preservation and access, permanent access to resources. Another important qualification here is, okay, the conference, as far as I understand it, is about this broad topic of uh, data curation, which is very broad. Uh, so I'm not going to talk about data curation in general, but just a specific aspect, which has to do with the management of identifiers. Let's forget for a moment about the persistent or persistent, but that's the topic. And identifiers are for sure a very important element in any uh, computer-based system. And when you have data, identifiers for sure, key uh, point to extract value from data. But in this topic, uh, I will focus in particular on uh, identifiers for non-digital resources. Not because what I'm going to say is not relevant for digital objects, but I think there is a fundamental difference here, and maybe people will disagree with that, in assigning identifiers to digital objects, like a paper or whatever, data set, I don't know, and other entities like people, as I say, institutions, projects, instruments, locations, because on, on the one hand, for digital objects, the key problem, the focus, is mainly on access, persistent formats, preservation. This is a key point, or even authorities, uh, intellectual property. But for entities, the key problem is more a philosophical issue. It has to do with identity. It is making sure that you recognize the same entity across systems, across data, uh, across languages, whatever it is, and this is more to do with identity rather than um, issue that like, um, as I said, access or provenance or stuff like that. So this is what I'm going to focus. And I think that um, the issue of identifiers can be a maybe a small issue in the broad context of data creation, but it's one of those issues that if you don't get them right from the beginning, you might have uh, some long-term negative consequences. On the other hand, if you get it right from the beginning, um, so somebody yesterday was saying, when you have an infrastructure, nobody says thank you, or say thank you when it works, the only people complain when it doesn't work. This is a similar situation. Very few people want to work directly on identifiers because they take them for granted. But the day something goes wrong, of course, people will complain. So this is the kind of topic that... Uh, this is a slide probably I don't need to really uh, explain here because I think it's pretty obvious for, for people here. This is just to say that uh, in the last, you know, 30, 40, 50 years, I don't know, we had, there was a big change in the issue of identifiers, not only identifiers, because we moved from a situation where for centuries people have learned how to uh, manage um, non-digital identifiers, like physical tags, for non-digital objects, like books, in libraries, for example, to a situation where we moved to more computer-based systems where we had a similar situation still, but we had digital identifiers now, some digital assets, but still we were in a situation with some kind of local single authority uh, is now basically minting uh, 
uh, keys in a database, something that, again, we were able to manage one way or another. And then we are now in a situation where actually, not only we have these digital identifiers for any kind of resource, including non-digital objects, uh, but we uh, have a very, um, you know, the, the, the situation is that we have many decentralized network information systems that must work together one way or another. Uh, but we have multiple authorities, and these authorities uh, sometimes don't want to give up their um, authority, okay? Uh, but still, we know that if we want to uh, extract the highest value from all this information, we need uh, some degree of coordination. And coordination, as usual, means trust, it means agreements, so the situation is fairly complex. And in this context, uh, as I said, I think the, for identifiers, the challenge has become the following. How can we manage uh, identifiers that are supposed to work across many, many boundaries? They traditionally uh, were, uh, so to say, isolated. The boundaries, of course, have to do with national boundaries, which means rules, policies, and whatever. It means organizational boundaries, so different business models, different cost models, different interests, um, corporate models, disciplinary, uh, sorry, boundaries, disciplinary boundaries, cultural boundaries, and so on and so forth. And last but not least, technological boundaries across systems. But probably this is not the most difficult part. The most difficult part is the other one, because, uh, you know, as a typical way of saying, we can always find a technical solution if we solve the other problems first. And this is a, a big challenge, because it's not obvious for an organization that has been managing, creating uh, identifiers for their own resources uh, to accept us of using, for example, identifiers that are, in a sense, partially out of their control, for example. And this is a, a big problem in general. So, uh, let's move to the cool versus persistent uh, stuff in the time. So, uh, in, in, the, in this context, uh, this, is a, this is an oversimplification. In the paper, you really find more details about the comparison between these two visions. But, in a sense, uh, when we were making the, the study uh, for the Commission, we found two broad communities that somehow were developing, uh, sometimes independent, sometimes conflicting, sometimes uh, partially collaborating solutions. One is, in a broad sense, the, the web community, and with the idea of linked data. And in my interviews with people coming from digital preservation, this approach was identified out, oh, cool your eyes. Even though this is not exactly uh, a complete description, because coolness is just one aspect <laughs> of web your eyes. But anyway, uh, this, was, uh, this is the reason why I use this uh, word here, cool your eyes, to mean this you know, idea of having uh, HTTP URIs for resources on a web architecture with all the stuff, you know, content negotiation, resolution, and so on and so forth. Uh, this approach, for sure, was driven uh, by a kind of technical vision. There was uh, a very strong architecture, very widespread, and we had a very good talk this morning you know, on the first keynote speech. And this was, the main driver was there, and uh, it was also research-oriented, so that means a lot of focus on uh, data integration, cross-linkage, mesh-up, definition of formats, uh, creating languages for sharing models, vocabularies, this was the focus. On the other hand, a completely different community. Here we have institutional repositories, libraries, research institutions, universities, all these uh, publishers, and the, the focus was completely different. It was more on social organizational principles. We need a solution which can be trusted by all these stakeholders, uh, based on some kind of formal commitments and agreements, uh, where there's a clear cost and business model for these things, and the focus for sure is more on uh, granting uh, access and preservation and archiving or curation, uh, making sure that you can always uh, have information about provenance, uh, data quality, you have authorities for data. So you see, it's a different terminology, different vocabulary, in a sense, different visions uh, on a problem which is you know, a similar problem, but from two very different perspectives. In this context, uh, we have worked on this project called OCAM, that was the name of the project I was talking about before, between 2008 and 2010, and the key idea of the project was to uh, basically develop what we call an entity system, here I would say 1.0, at that time we didn't know there was a 2.0, so we just was the entity system, and the, just a nice analogy, just to take it uh, literally, the idea was to have some kind of DNS for the semantic web. 
the, the analogy with the DNS is in the sense that you want something very thin, you know, something that which is not really, that is not providing many complex or value-added services, but something very simple you take for granted. When you have a domain name, you want it to be sold to the right server, and you want uh, to get data from the right server. So people, even most people don't know that they're using the DNS, but it's something fundamental in the architecture to uh, map domain names or IP numbers. So the idea was more or less that an identifier in the ENS, the entity link system, would be like some kind of IP number uh, for an entity, uh, and any description of an entity associated to a different URI, for example, DPP the URI, Freebase URI, or whatever, GeoNames URI, uh, is a, some kind of uh, symbolic name, or in this case, a name for a representation of the entity, uh, which can be mapped to the same uh, entity identifier. The, the advantage that we wanted to uh, uh, reach with this way was that if you have people using the same identifier for the same entity everywhere, okay, the integration is a kind of trigger task, okay, because it's not a matter of reasoning, computing, discovering, mapping, so on the fly, or whatever. It's just a matter of graph matching. You have different graphs, RDF graphs, for example. You find the same, uh, the same URI on different nodes, you merge the graphs, that's it. At the data level, so at the, at the entity level, uh, this is trigger, technically trigger. So you don't need all the stuff of outside men, which became very popular with the link of data. I would say a lot about that. I don't think this was the right thing to do, but uh, okay. Uh, and the entity the system had was really a service with very simple, simple core uh, services and APIs. The first idea was uh, there was a simple way of managing the ID like software um, process of creating an identifier, storing an identifier, updating, mapping the identifier with other identifiers known for the same entity, merging. Uh, two identifiers if you discover the same entity, all these, all these things. Uh, the key part was the entity matching module. So something that taking any description of an entity, we didn't want to make any assumption about vocabulary, schemas, or whatever. You give any description, keywords, or name value pairs, or whatever you have, and we try to find uh, the right ID to, or the ID for that entity in the, uh, in the repository. And then the ID mapping, which is we uh, expose these uh, mappings between identifiers uh, to an API to make them available to other applications. Uh, so, in the ENS 1.0, the idea was the following, basically the architecture. So I know it's very small, but the key point is very simple. You have real world entities at the bottom. You have in the, in the middle the entity in the system as a repository of identifiers for these entities. The identifier is a long string including the resolver, the HTTP, open the port stuff. One mistake. And the idea is now uh, people in their data set can either reuse this identifier in the data or they use their identifier and they map it to the ENS on the, let's say, canonical ID for the entity, if you want. Okay? Uh, a typical example of a process of this, application of this, is, which we did in the Open project, is this is my profile. This is, you don't see it, but it doesn't matter. It's a list of alternative URIs for me in uh, semanticweb.org, in uh, DBLP, in many, many locations. There is a, I don't know if you are familiar, this is a search engine, uh, not, sorry, not search engine, it's an entity centric search engine for uh, entities on the web, for Sigma. If you search by Occam ID, okay, which is on top, okay, uh, the, the Sigma will ask the entity system, do you know any other URI for this entity? And the result is a mashup of information starting from data sets which either contain my Occam ID or uh, contain um, an ID which is marked on my Occam ID. So that's it. It's very simple, but this kind of integration happens for free at this point. It's very simple. Okay, sorry, it wasn't. But we made everybody unhappy. That, that's the thing. We made a big mistake in the project. And I blame myself for this mistake. Because on the one hand, for the linked data community, we created something which was centralized from that point of view, which is evil, of course. Mm -hmm. You should not centralize anything, okay, on the web. Uh, and on the other hand, the bigger mistake was that we took the entire URI as an identifier for the entity, which means that if people wanted to reuse our identifier, it would be resolved on the entity system and not on their data. This was a big mistake we made with the linked data community, so they didn't want to use the ENS. Okay? But we also made a mistake with respect to the persistent identifier community because uh, the system didn't have, uh, was not trustable in a sense from this, one, uh, from this community. In the sense that it was a technical solution, but it didn't have behind it an organizational structure that would 
um, make sure for that uh, important stakeholders like publishers or whatever would trust this thing to work in the long term. And um, so there was no clear governance model. There was no clear policy for creating entities and deleting entities. So in the end, we didn't make we we made everybody unhappy with the solution. And the the the, the success was very limited, it only in limited domains. So and this is uh, the main topic of the paper that you see uh, in, in the conference. We are now working in developing a second version of ENS, where we are trying to rectify some of these mistakes. Okay, number one is. We still have the real world entities at the bottom, but this time the only thing we assign as an identifier to the entity is a token, uh, which is guaranteed to be unique for the entity and that will be uh, persistent through time because it will never happen that the same and, and that the same ID will be assigned to different entities. Or if it happens by mistake, there are ways to uh, correct it. But now uh, the the ENS is only the default resolver for this um, token, which means that if you don't have any other uh, system providing data for the entity, you can resolve the URI on the ENS and get the profile we have in the ENS. But this profile is not authoritative at all. It's just meant for matching. We keep this data only because we need something to match uh, data with uh, our system and find the right ID. Okay? But the key point now is that we have a method for uh, letting other people to use this token uh, appended to their own uh, resolver, which means that now the idea is uh, you can have, uh, I just put names by saying, sorry, it's not uh, the, the national library, the German national, national library, it's just examples, it, it's fake, it's not real. But what I mean is that now we can uh, accept any number of resolvers for the same token and we keep a registry of resolvers so that now the point is, we have lots of URIs which have a different uh, syntactical structure, except for the final part, which is a common token. Which means that now we are trying to put together the advantage of graph magic as a simple way for data integration, and still making sure that the identifiers can be resolved by any number of resolver providing different data, okay, about the entity. So the ENS is not a data provider; it's this kind of gateway to point to other resolvers, okay. But what we do is make sure that you need the token for power, no problem. This is a token. Append it to your uh, resolver, whatever it is, your resolver, and you return your data. But the integration will be simple. This is more or less the idea. Uh, OK, I'm done. So this is what I just said in another way. There is a default resolver in the ENS, but we can have any number of resolvers that provide local data about the same entity. So what, what does that mean for uh, data curators, for example? The, the idea is that we have, again, this morning there was uh, something, uh, you know, the, the keynote speak, uh, speak, speaker said it's much better if we try to uh, inter make it ourselves interoperable with a single infrastructure rather than having point to point interoperability between pairs of systems. Here, more or less, the idea is the same. If you have data sets, one idea could be to align it with the ENS. Aligning means, okay, pushing entities on the, on the APIs of the ENS and try to get the ID for the entity or create the ID for the entity if it's not there and use it as, an identity, as, a, as a token as part of the identifiers for your entity in your dataset. Okay? That means that even without any interaction between these two datasets, it's possible to know that there is the same entity, the red circles, okay, in the three datasets. And now, on top of this, people will build uh, value-added services, okay, and the data will be in a much better shape because the integration is, in a sense, for free now. Okay? And this is uh, more or less the, the architecture. I don't want to go into details because I'm already <laughs> going too long. So here was a list of advantages. I will not go through the list. It's very late. But for the point of view of persistent defined, I think the key point, the key message is uh, the ENS is not yet another solution for identifiers. It's just a very thin layer they want to put on uh, in the, in the ecosystem to make sure that there is interoperability between identifiers and this interoperability is granted through open uh, services, very simple services like returning mappings or stuff like that. So this is extremely thin and is not providing any particular service for any community except this alignment with identifiers. Um, and the cost model is very simple because this is cheap. Unlike you know, a big platform where you provide the identifiers and the services, which means a lot of data, a lot of hardware for the um, 
linked with the community, it's more or less what they done so far. There's a limitation in the freedom of meeting your eyes, in the sense that you can still meet your URI, but the idea is if you get the token and you use it in your URI, or at least you map it on your URI, okay, you will make your data much more uh, easy to um, for managing integration with other data sets without losing your freedom of returning your data and not resolving the identifier in another path. Okay? In this picture, what we're looking for is uh, partners who can help us to set up the, this infrastructure as a, an open public trust. This is the organizational form we have selected for this thing uh, with a governing board. We want institutional companies who have data uh, to experiment with us and see if it really makes sense for them to use it, and I think it does. Uh, we are already establishing collaboration with other ID initiatives uh, to ensure a high level of interoperability, and we need also to improve our matching modules because we must have specific modules for specific type of entities. We have already a few modules, but then conclusions. I already discussed the first one. Uh, I think we are in front of a fundamental trade-off that we've seen many times on the internet between centralization and decentralization. Uh, I remember I spoke with Jeff Bilder uh, a year ago, and he told me, you know, it was very nice in, in a dinner, uh, every good idea on the web starts decentralized and end up with some degree of centralization. I think that in a sense, this is uh, an important truth. And the point is the trade-off. Where do you put it on the limit? I think for the semantic web, in, for this semantic layer, which is uh, the layer of linking data and using data for you know, analysis and whatever you want, uh, we need this small degree of centralization to agree on a token which is provided by a third party service to make sure that all, your own services, in house services, work better and can be integrated in a much easier way. And I think this is a, 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 an important conclusion. Thank you very much. Sorry, I went a bit long.